Well, good morning. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, as, as was just mentioned, Blue River is an agricultural robotics company based in uh, California. When I joined the team about four years ago, it was just three guys in a tiny little Silicon Valley office. Uh, we had no money, no product, and no customer, but we had big ideas. And we were lucky enough that a, a Silicon Valley investor, uh, Vinod Kosla with Kosla Ventures, was willing to take a bet on a group of smart guys with a vision for robots in every field, uh, machines that could see every plant in the field and, and spray every plant in the field. Over that time, we've raised uh, three rounds of funding, a seed, a Series A, and a Series B, totaling $30 million. And we've um, developed the technology and started to deploy it in California vegetables. Uh, and in that time, we've learned a lot about applying automation, robotics, and machine learning into agriculture. And that's what a, a little bit of what I want to share today. Uh, we'll do that in, in three general parts. One will be a definition of some of the technology and the trends that are happening just in the technology itself. Another, we'll, uh, I'll look at how some of that technology is being applied into agriculture in ways that Blue River isn't focusing on. And then I'll end with how Blue River is applying these, these technologies, these robotics into agriculture. Of course, I'll leave some time at the end uh, for questions. I'd much rather talk about the things that, that you all are interested in hearing than, than just what I would guess. So first, some definitions. It turns out Robot is a very tricky thing to define. Even internally at Blue River, in a company full of roboticists, we can't agree on what it means. But at its highest level, a robot is a machine that can sense the world around it, can understand where it is and what, it's, what the world looks like. It can use that information to decide, to decide what action it wants to take. And then it can act. It can act with that information in whatever way it's decided and prescribed. The best robotics actually close that loop and sense how that action went to verify that it was correct. You can imagine if I wanted to pick up this glass, I first need to see it, I need to decide how to orient my hands, and then I need to try to do it. And it'd be really useful to know if, it, if I was off by an inch and knocked it over, so that next time I can do it a little better. So having this sense decide act be a, be a closed loop is a very important part of robotics. This loop can also be applied at kind of the very micro level of picking up a glass, or it can be applied at the very macro level of, say, I want a self-driving car to drive from Toronto to New York. That's a very big problem within which you'll need to sense the side and act many, many times. But then there's this larger overarching thing uh, where you also need to sense the side and act. So it can happen on bo both levels. Um, I think, to me, this framework is really useful. It's maybe um, good to look at an example in everyday life to how do we know when we see a robot? What, what qualifies as a robot? And to do that, let's take a look at an everyday problem. Dirty dishes. This is something that happens in every, every kitchen in the world. Uh, we can imagine a, a, a robot that washes dishes standing at the sink. It senses. It senses the dishes are dirty, senses how hot the water is, senses where the plate is, determines how to pick it up and do it. It decides, based on how dirty the dishes are, how to wash them. And then it actually does all of that and stacks the dishes by the, by the sink. Now, Luckily, we don't need to design that robot. We already have a dishwasher. Now, a dishwasher isn't a robot in the futuristic sense of the term, but that's kind of the whole point. It, it still senses. It senses the, how hot the water is and how dirty the dishes are. It decides how long and what type of wash cycle to do, and it actually then cleans the dishes. And this is the, the thing about robotics. As soon as they turn into a machine that reliably does something valuable in our lives day in and day out, we stop calling them robotics. It's no longer a robot. It's just a machine, and we call what it does automation. And that's the kind of thing that we can invest in. That's the kind of thing that will, will happen in the next couple of years. A robot is just something in the future. It's, it's always at the boundary of what's possible in technology. Machines and automation is what's here today. Now, that doesn't mean we have to give up on our vision for the future of a robot in, in every field. Um, I like a, a Bill, Bill Gates quote. He once said that we always overestimate the impact that technology will have in the next two years and underestimate the impact it'll have in 10. And I think that applies here. This picture isn't going to be what the farm looks like in two years because we're not going to be this advanced. It's also not going to be what it looks like in 10 years because we can't possibly predict what robotics are going to bring to the farm. And so the task for us as both technology companies and, and as investors is to figure out the equivalent of the dishwasher. Where can we take a a simple machine and create a lot of value today and then incrementally improve it until it delivers something even better than this picture. So that's robotics, sense the side acts. And within the robots, they use computers to do each of these steps, sense the side and act. And the better the computer is at each of the steps, the better the robot will be. 
This is where machine learning comes into play. We've been teaching computers since the very beginning how to do things. And mostly that was teaching the computers how to memorize things. Memorize the rules of math, such when we ask a computer what's 2 plus 2, it can look into its memory, what it's memorized, and give us the answer. And computers are very good at memorization. Um, you can also think of machine learning like the development of a child. At the very beginning, kind of learns very simple ways to sense and interact with the world and then gets better. And one way to think about this, researchers love using games to test what's possible with machine learning. In the very beginning, it was just simply teaching a machine through machine learning to identify the checkers on a checkerboard. You have to be able to see the pieces to be able to play. And then, as it turns out, the researchers realized that when there's 10 pieces left on a checker, checkers board, there's about a trillion ways that that game can go. And so they just decided, well, computers are good at memorizing. Let's teach the computer all trillion possibilities, such that when it sees anyone, it knows exactly how to act and exactly how to win the game. And we did that. So we graduated. We went to chess, a more complicated game. Still the same approach. We can generally predict every situation that the chessboard will have, that the computer will see when trying to win. And we can teach it through some, some slightly more clever algorithms to know what to do in every single one of those situations. Now, there's a bunch of, bunch of situations in life where we can't prescribe as specifically how we want the machine to act, how we want the computer to take the information and do it. Uh, the farm is a great example. No two fields in, in any given year are ever going to be the same. We can't just teach it all trillion rules in that situation. It needs to have something more like intuition, something more like how, um, how humans, how an agronomist would take that situation and do it. And there's a board game called Go, which I've never played and know very little about. But from what people tell me, it's a very complex game where the best human players don't memorize all of the possible combinations. They try to learn an intuition about when they see the board, what the right next set of moves is. And it's this intuition that allows them to be successful. And a couple of months ago, you may have seen in the news, uh, Google created a deep learning algorithm called AlphaGo that beat some of the, one of the top Go players in the world. And finally, we've been able to teach computers not just memorization, but how to have intuition, how to take a situation that we can't prescribe exactly what's happening, yet tell it the result we want and, and be able to give us uh, the, the, the conclusion that we want. And this is exciting. This is, this is something that brings computers into a realm of much more useful, to much more unstructured environments. Is this a weed? Is this a crop? How should I fertilize this plant? What should I do with this massive amount of information? So how do we apply that to the farm? A farm, actually, uh, you can take the same sense to side act and apply it to the farm. Now, I'm not saying that in the next couple of years we're going to just develop a robot that will replace the farmer. That's a much longer way out. But what the farmer does, does represent the sense of the side and act. On the sense side, he needs to know what's going on in his fields. He needs to know the soil. He needs to get, his, get in his pickup truck and scout and understand what's going on. He needs to use that information to decide. Typically today, again, it's with an agronomist because it's such a complex environment. And then act. Here I've included uh, both the inputs, like seeds and fertilizers, herbicides, other crop protectants as well as the equipment that applies it. Now, this is a very integrated picture. You can't do any, the farmer can't do anything without knowledge of the others, um, which is why the farmer in this case is so critical. In addition, um, it's kind of important to understand where the value goes today. Today, farmers don't spend a whole lot on sensing. They get in their pickup and drive. They maybe pay some consultants or soil, sense, soil, uh, soil tests. They don't spend much on decisions. Uh, maybe they'll pay an agronomist as a consultant, or maybe they'll actually buy inputs from their ag retailer, who's giving them a recommendation on the decision. Where most of the money goes today is the inputs, the seeds, the herbicides, the equipment. In addition, within the farmer, there's a big range of, of returns to that farmer. If the farmer is able to use all the tools effectively, makes good money. The, the farmers who are less able to capture all of the, the latest technologies make less money can hold that as we think about how these technologies will impact this farmer's world, not only making the, farm, the farmer more profitable, but where the profit will sit in this ecosystem. So sensing. The challenge that the farmer faces with sensing is as farms have gotten bigger and as we planted crops more densely, you have to cover tens of thousands of acres often. Uh, it's difficult to do from your pickup truck. 
and we just saw a, a bunch of uh, presentations about um, the ways that robotics and machine learning can help this. It's really useful to be able to take a drone or a plane flown by a human or a satellite to get very frequent views of your, of your field. And you get something like this that we, we just saw, a vegetative index. You can not only cover all of the grounds that you need to, but you can start to see things that a human can't. And this is all about robotics being able to, to fly the field automatically and machine learning to be able to pull insights out. And so what value does this drive for the farmer? Who, what's going to differentiate the 100 different drone companies that, that I've run into? Uh, my two cents on this is that there'll be companies who just focus on delivering farmers the best information. And the people who will win here will either have, will have a competitive advantage in delivering the best data set to the farmer. Now, best, I think, is a little bit difficult to define. Is that frequency? Is that resolution? Is that being able to pull out information from it? It's a little unclear. But someone like Planet Labs is going to win on frequently, frequency. They can take a satellite image of a field every day. But it's going to be low resolution and, and, and obscured by clouds much of the time. A drone, much more difficult to cover a lot of ground, but you'll have a lot better information. To me, I'm not sure how that's going to play out. But I do know that many people are pushing beyond just providing information to pushing into decisions. Because of course, the information that, a, that your scouting collects is only as good as the decisions that you can make from it. And of course, your decisions are only good as the actions that you can take with it. So again, it comes back to an integrated picture. So any company that, that talks about the sensing either needs to have just great information or very tight integration with the rest of the loop. I think we're starting to hear a little bit about drones that do this whole thing. There's some drones out of Japan that uh, can not only sense the crop, but decide and actually apply things. They're carrying a payload of fungicide, for example, to address powdery mildew in vineyards. It's really useful application in vineyards where there's a very difficult to reach place on a hill that has a very concentrated problem. It's hard for me to imagine uh, drones flying around carrying payloads, delivering all inputs to the field, but We'll see. I think it's an exciting time in the, in the sensing space where the farmer really hasn't had tools before, and all of a sudden there's hundreds of tools out there to make sensing better. I think decisions is another interesting place where this technology can be applied. Um, this is a, the challenge here is, of course, that the, the farmer is overloaded with information. This is a great, uh, a great sketch from Tom Farms in Indiana, a very progressive and successful farmer in the United States. Um, showing just how much information the modern farm uh, has to digest and has to make decisions with. It's not just all of the connected equipment that we have now, but it's these scouting, these planes, these drones, these satellites, the insurance companies, the commodity markets, the pricing of fertilizer, all can have an impact on that decision. And this pretty quickly becomes a complex situation similar to that one we were talking about earlier where you need an intuition. You need someone who can learn over time how best to navigate this environment. And machine learning and deep learning can be really good at this. And so I think there's a lot of tools that are out there to do it. Now, from an investing perspective, we've, there was a good conversation earlier about 96 companies being funded in the, in the farmer decision assistance space, whether it's a dashboard or something else. Um, and to me, the, the, what will differentiate companies in this space is inability to collect the biggest data set collect the most customers, collect the most acres, and feed that machine learning engine. The more information you provide to the machine learning, it, the better it will be. Either that, or they'll need to link closely with Sense and Acts. Because again, your decisions are only as good as the information coming in. If you have garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. And your decision requires on your ability to act. You could go into the, into the season with the perfect plan, the perfect set of decisions. And if the equipment isn't available to do it, or your equipment isn't capable of doing it, then it's not going to be there. And you see companies navigating this in, in, in different ways. You see a Farmer's Edge deploying their own sensors on the farm. Um, you see Farmer's Business Network actually moving into the, the input supply, into the act, in linking the decision and the action, very similar to how ag retailers were. So I think this is another very interesting space where machine learning in particular will make a big difference. And kind of as was discussed before, there will probably be a shakeout. I don't think there's space for 96 here, especially since this is a very traditional kind of return, return to scale type of environment. Finally, we get to act. Um, first, we'll talk a little bit about the inputs, the seeds, the, the fertilizers, the herbicides, and how machine learning and automation can help there. 
Traditionally, uh, in breeding, for example, there's a lot of um, very labor-intensive steps. Uh, for example, one step of the breeding process uh, is linking the, the genotype with the phenotype, the physical characteristics of the plant. Traditionally, how that's done is you plant a seed, you come back when it's, when it's grown with a little uh, hole punch, you collect a hole punch from the leaf, and you, you, sequence, you sequence that to, to make the link between the physical characteristics of the plants and the genes. Well, Monsanto, an engineer at Monsanto, was very clever and figured out that you could cut a whole year out of the commercialization cycle by creating a seed chipper. You could create a robot that would take a seed, identify its orientation, and chip out a little, a little part of the top. And you can see that on the, on the right here, the little chip that's missing from each of the seeds. And then those seeds are, are filtered down into the, to the trays at the lower left and, and tracked. And then you can automatically sequence the seed. Very simple and elegant application of automation that made a very big impact on their business. Um, if you ever are lucky enough to take a tour of the, the St. Louis uh, headquarters, or the, the headquarters of uh, Monsanto in St. Louis, this is a great part of the tour. They're, they're very excited about this. Um, I think machine learning and robotics can, can do the same thing in other inputs, whether it's the discovery of new molecules, whether they're inorganic or, or organic, uh, whether it's the, the discovery of, um, of microbes, just actually, had never heard of anyone using computer vision in helping understand the impact of uh, microbes like we just saw from this last presentation. But I think that's a great application in, in speeding up, in, in getting better at quickly finding the microbes that matter. Inputs have been the story of uh, yield increases in agriculture for the past 50 years. The story has been find better inputs, deliver to the farm, teach them how to use them, and teach them how to use more of them. That's what's driven yield more than anything else. Now, I think there's a few blockbuster products left on the table, whether that's new varieties or, or new inputs. Um, but it's hard to imagine this trend continuing forever. Um, this is actually a little bit out of date. Instead of uh, 300 bushels an acre, it's 500 bushels an acre is the, is the latest uh, yield. And that comes not from using unique inputs, but from using the inputs in a smarter way. There's an opportunity to use all of the tools that we have, the seeds, the herbicides, the fertilizers, in a more intelligent way to get closer to that 500 bushel. And that's where I think the next phase of yield increases will come from, the next increase of profitability on the farm. And of course, to use all these inputs in a smarter way, you have to have smarter application equipment. And this is where the Blue River story comes in. This is what I get excited about, is smarter equipment in the field. If we think about what this equipment is trying to do, it's trying to make every plant perfect, trying to get every, every seed planted at the right depth, at the right time, in the right place, trying to fertilize each plant, trying to protect each plant from weeds and other, other, other diseases. And this gets complicated when we think about the modern farm. There's tens of thousands of acres with 50,000 plants an acre. That's a difficult problem if we need to cover all of that in a, in a, in a, in a reasonable time frame. So the solution, is to treat every plant the same. This is what the, the more or less the, the latest and greatest from the equipment manufacturers are. They've taken a look at this scale problem and said, let's treat every plant the same. And this ends up looking like this, where you're applying things uniformly across the field, whether or not that plant or that part of the, the field needs it. And this is akin to, um, say, a few people in Toronto have an infection. And the only solution you have to treat them is to give antibiotics to every man, woman, and child in Toronto. Now, that's great. It solves your problem. The people are cured. But it has all, it's really expensive. And it has all kinds of negative side effects. Uh, and we're, we see that with antibiotics. We're also seeing this with herbicides and weeds. If you apply herbicides uniformly across the field, no matter whether they're needed or not, no matter whether that plant is a, is a weed or not, you start to get resistance. So in 1995, before uh, Roundup Ready, before GM really hit the market, there was a few instances in the United States, at least, of herbicide-resistant weeds, weeds that were resistant to glyphosate, dicamba, or 2,4-D, mostly in wheat growing areas. 10 years later, the problem had spread. More, more acres in more states in the US that are resistant. And last year, it's an epi epi epidemic. There's estimated to be 50, 60, 70 million acres in the US that are infested with weeds that don't die when you spray them with your typical dose of herbicide. And so what the farmers are having to do is they're having to rethink how they, they manage weeds. It's no longer one trip of one mode of action. It's multiple modes of action in that trip. It's pre-emergent herbicide. It's tillage. It's different crop rotations. It's even some folks in the south are sending hand crews out into cotton fields. 
to chop out the, palm, the palmer amaranth that's resistant to Roundup. It's a big problem. And not to leave Canada out of, out of it, but unfortunately Canada is just as red in the United States in this. It's a global problem. Um, every country that has a modern agriculture ecosystem and good statistics shows up on this chart. Um, we need new solutions. There's not necessarily any silver bullets coming down the pipeline. It's more than $300 million to deliver a new herbicide molecule uh, from, from discovery to commercialization through the regulatory hurdles. There's a few in the pipeline that people were hoping would be available this year, enlist and extend, maybe a couple years down the road before that gets through. And they're not necessarily going to be silver bullets. The answer here is to use the technologies that we have in a smarter way. So this is our vision. This is, this is what, what Blue River imagines the solution to this problem. We imagine that we'll have see and spray machines in every field. These machines will, as they go through the field, will be able to see every plant in the field, know whether it's a weed or a crop, know if it's a crop, its health and other general characteristics, be able to use that information to decide, going back to our robotics framework, to decide what to do, where to apply herbicide, where to apply fertilizer, and then act and spray very precisely. Have a little loop there. We'll start with herbicide, weed control. It's, a, it's the needs of today, but there's no reason we can't apply any input that the farmer wants, whether it's a fertilizer, micronutrient, uh, fungicide, insecticide, biological, RNAi, anything, that, anything that, that input manufacturers come up with that would be beneficial to the crop during the season, we can precisely apply it. And what we're finding is we're starting to deploy these machines in our test market in California, is that because no one's ever been able to apply inputs at the square inch level, uh, before in a field, no one really knows how to do that. And so we have an exciting opportunity to experiment, to know exactly how much herbicide does it take to kill this weed, exactly how much fertilizer will benefit this plant. And that's just what we're starting to do, is in every field, in our, every field that our machine goes into, we can run a little, a little controlled experiment. Exactly how much uh, herbicide does it take to kill a weed? Well, we can try this amount here, a different amount there, and a different amount there allowing the farmer to understand in their situation how best to apply the inputs that are available. And of course, as all agronomic experiments, the way that traditionally we would understand the results from this is send an army of people out into the field with clipboards. As technologists, we really don't want to do that. That's a big reason why farmers don't experiment today. And so instead, we'll add remote sensing. We're adding remote sensing to measure and learn from those experiments, such that there's an automatic loop where the farmer or a researcher can prescribe exactly the experiments they want to do to understand the inputs a little better, execute with a and spray machine the experiments, and then automatically measure and learn so that they can get better every time. This will unlock for us and for our, for our growers that use our equipment an ability to precisely compare for the first time different seed varieties and how they behave in the, in the situation. Different herbicide, different weed management programs, different fertilizer programs, really unlocking the potential of that 500 bushel acre corn. Not just relying on what an agronomist recommends or what the person selling you the seed recommends, but from your own field, from your own information. So seed and spray. How do we get this to work? How do we apply machine learning and robotics to actually do this? So this is a, a cornfield in Wisconsin, uh, a very weedy cornfield. It may actually be a little hard to see in this context, but maybe that's a little bit of the point. It's often very hard to, in, in agriculture to distinguish the, what you're seeing, the crop from the weed. And that's just what we're doing. We're collecting, uh, from a machine learning basis, we're collecting some of the largest databases of, of individual plants that have ever existed. We've already done that in lettuce and, and starting to in corn. And this is the first step in that process, just to, to differentiate the, the plants from the soil. In this, in this particular case, we don't care about the soil. And then the output of the machine learning algorithms is exactly where every plant is, exactly where the row is. And for each plant, we know a lot about it. We know its leaf area. We know exactly where it enters the ground. And we can use that information to just apply herbicide to the weeds, which we've already identified in that, in that middle image, or to do things with the plant, deter, distinguish how the plants are different from each other, and apply inputs differentially to them. Now this, uh, as machine learning goes, these get better the more data we collect, and we're already starting to think about collecting data in other crops. So this summer we'll be moving into cotton and soy and tomatoes to collect as much information as we can to get a head start on the C part of our system. 
The other half of the sea and spray system, of course, is the spray. You can imagine this problem, um, the spray problem of precisely applying inputs to the field, as if, if on this table here I lined up a bunch of shot glasses about 10 inches apart and then handed you a pitcher and asked you to run by at five miles an hour, perfectly filling each shot glass without spilling a drop. That's about what we're trying to do in, in the precise application of herbicides especially into agriculture. Because if you spill a drop of that herbicide on a plant you want to keep on your crop, it's a big problem. And so you have to have the five millimeter precision that we've been able to get. You can see here, this is uh, again in our test market of lettuce, where we're trying to, to eliminate some of the, the lettuce plants and leave just the ones that we want to, to make it to maturity. And that spray line on the right is perfectly placed there between the crop we want to keep and the plant we want to eliminate. We're able to do that with the five millimeter accuracy and with the verification. So we quickly realized that if we're spraying a lot of plants in the field, the only thing that the farmer hates more than a field full of weeds is a field full of nothing. We better be sure that herbicide is only going on the weeds. And so we, we actually use a second camera in our system to recognize where we sp spray and calibrate in real time such that if we hit a little bit of a rock or the temperature changes or the height changes that we can maintain that five millimeter accuracy in every field in every situation. This is just an image of uh, a few days after we do our operation. You can see that the plants that we've wanted to eliminate, the plants that we've applied the herbicide to, um, are, have been removed and the, the crop is, is remaining there and can gather all the resources it needs to make it to maturity. One other thing we've learned in applying machine learning and robotics into agriculture is that typical machine learning applications look more like this. You have an entire warehouse full of top-end computers where in any one bank of 10 computers, if it goes out, you just move it to the next one. IT isn't really, uh, reliability isn't really a problem in most machine learning applications. But for us, it's a big problem. If something goes down, we need to go out into the field and replace it. If we're trying to troubleshoot something, we're out there in the vibration and the dust and the rain and the wind trying to do it. And so a big part of what we've done is not just getting the sheen spray to the performance that we want, but get it to work every time, in every field, 10 hours a day. And this is how that all comes together. This is our, uh, what I would call our proof of concept machines. We have six of them working in California vegetables. This particular machine is, is doing 18 seed lines at once moving through the field at about three or four miles an hour, seeing and spraying about 5,000 plants per minute with that five millimeter accuracy. Now, this has been a way for us to prove the technology, to develop the technology. Vegetables are a year-round market, where corn and soy is, is just once a year. In addition, it's turned out to be a nice little business for us. We actually uh, were on 10% of lettuce grown in the US. We charge a slight premium relative to the farmer's alternative because we do a better job and actually increase yields. Um, and we're very happy with it, and it's been a great place to, to test the technology. And this is our mission. The mission of all the technology is to get it to where it's more applicable on a broad scale to crops that are not specialty vegetables and to, to our more broad acre. And there's a couple things playing in our favor here. One, there's a concept called the experience curve, which is very typical in manufacturing, where the more an industry makes something, the more an industry uh, has experience, the cheaper that thing gets. And for us, that's acres, getting our machine on acres. Machine learning also helps in, the, in this case. The more information we collect, the more we use our machine, the better and the cheaper it gets. So when we ran our machine over the first 100 acres, just a rough calculation, I bet it costs more than 500 bucks an acre to do that. Unsustainable, right? But continually over time, we've been able to learn. And now we're well past the 10,000 acre mark with our equipment in production fields. And the goal for us is to get all the way past that 100,000 acre mark where we believe the cost of this equipment will be well below $50 an acre to deploy. And once we get there, we can really deploy this equipment uh, to the extent of our vision. The system is very modular. All of the intelligence of the scene spray system is in a seed line unit, which you can see in the, in the highlight here. It has the cameras, it has the computers, it has the sprayers. And what that means is if you want to customize it to any individual crop, you just have to train, first train your machine learning algorithms to identify what you want in that particular situation, and then build a toolbar that matches the farmer's configurations. Once you do that, seed spray can be deployed in, any, in almost any situation in agriculture. And this is the vision that it unlocks. We can start to think about 
taking action in the field at the plant level, knowing that this weed, it, it makes sense to apply a half a cent of herbicide to that weed. Or this plant, it, it makes sense to apply a penny of fertilizer because I know with that penny of fertilizer, I'll get a nickel back. Rather than thinking about it at the field level, why don't we think about optimizing our investment on the farm at the plant level? That's what we can do with seed and spray. And so bringing it full circle. Sense, decide, act, very, very prevalent on the farm. Someday, maybe, we'll have robots that do all of it. And a farmer can just sit in his living room and, and manage it from there. In the meantime, I think there's tons of opportunity for these technologies to have an impact in the sensing and scouting side, in the decision side, and in the acting side. That's it. Time for any questions. <laughs>